Okay, so now we're beginning chapter 20, which focuses on the chemistry of carboxylic acids and nitriles. So just like any functional group, whenever we encounter the functional group, we should first talk about how to name compounds related to carboxylic acids and nitriles. So in terms of naming carboxylic acids, there are two major conventions depending on whether your carboxylic acid is cyclic or acyclic. For acyclic carboxylic acids, you name the longest parent chain containing the carboxylic acid. And if the carboxylic acid is attached to the longest chain, you replace the terminal E of the alkane name with the oic acid suffix. The carboxyl carbon atom is assigned the lowest possible locate number, which will almost always be carbon one. So for example, if you have a propane chain containing a carboxylic acid, it would be propanoic acid. Similarly, if we have this 4-methylpentane chain, notice how the carboxylic acid carbon is assigned to locant number 1. So we would name this compound as 4-methylpentanoic acid. In the case where you have two carboxylic acid functional groups, you assign your locant numbers to give the lowest possible set of locant numbers. So we name this compound as 3-ethyl, 6-methyl octane dioic acid, with the dioic suffix being used to account for the fact we have two carboxylic acid functional groups. Now, let's really look at this example and let's notice something pretty important here. Why do we assign the ethyl the locant number of three? Why are we giving ethyl the lowest locant number? Would anyone like to provide an explanation or justification? Because alphabetically it comes first. Exactly, exactly. We have an even choice between assigning the locant number of three to the methyl or ethyl. Ethyl is first alphabetically, so we name this compound as three ethyl, 6-methyl octane dioic acid. So the carboxylic acids will always be on the end of the chains though, right? Yeah. Yes, so okay. all, they will always, in almost every case that you see, if the carboxylic acid is the highest priority functional group, we'll get the locant number one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect, perfect. So again, we always start assigning our locant numbers, in this case, to give the carboxylic acid the lowest possible locant number. There are two possible ways for us to count our carbon locant numbers from left to right or right to left. In this case, they're non-identical because we have to, in the event of a tie, assign the smallest locant number to the first substituent alphabetically. That's why it's 3-ethyl, 6-methyl, octane dioic acid. Does that make sense? I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. So um, did we choose to number it from left to right because ethyl is before methyl alphabetically? Yes, and okay. the locant numbers from both counting methods are identical. Okay, yeah. All right, thank you. Perfect. Now. If you have a cyclic carboxylic acid, then you have to use a slightly different naming convention. You name the longest parent ring containing the carboxylic acid, and compounds with a carboxylic acid bonded to a ring are named using the suffix carboxylic acid. The carboxyl carbon atom is assigned the lowest possible locant number of one, and the carboxyl carbon is not numbered in this system. So for example, we would name this cyclohexane ring containing a carboxylic acid as 4-hydroxy cyclohexane carboxylic acid. To denote stereochemistry, we use the trans prefix. 
You can also use R and S configuration assignments and note the configuration at each of these two centers. The reason why when naming this compound, the trans prefix is used is because these two centers are genuine stereocenters. If you want to denote the relative stereochemistry, cis and trans becomes more appropriate to use. The other thing I'd like you to note is that the locant number for the carbon attached to the carboxylic acid is implied to be one. Did that answer your question? So looking at this second example, in this case, we have one cyclopentene and because the carboxylic acid is attached to a cyclic chain, we name this using the suffix carboxylic acid. Does that make sense, Tevro? Any questions do I address? So um, on for cyclic, we don't count the carbon on the carboxyl you functional don't, group. You but... don't explicitly note that locant number. The, the carbon associated with the carboxylic acid is not counted because your numbering convention focuses on the longest carbon chain, which is your cyclic chain. Okay. okay. Instead, what you do is you assign a locant number of one to the carbon attached to your carboxylic acid. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So let's try to practice what we've learned with this important note that carboxylic acids are the highest priority substituent and functional group covered so far. So let's take a look at this first compound A and let's take about three to four minutes and let's try to develop a reasonable IUPAC name for this compound. So let's take about three to four minutes to work through this example. And I'd like students to share their responses in the chat verbally or annotated directly onto the class whiteboard using the annotate tool. And although this is a somewhat simple structure, it highlights an important point when it comes to carboxylic acid nomenclature in that you name the longest chain that contains your carboxylic acid. So we have a proposed name of 4-ethyl pentanoic acid. Okay. Now looking at this proposed name, oh, we have a revision, 2-ethyl pentanoic acid. So we're using the following locant numbers. So we have an ethyl group at the two position, we have a pentane chain, and then the ending turns into pentanoic acid. What does the class think? Do you agree with this proposed name? Do you disagree? Do you have any questions? What does the rest of the class think? This proposed name looks completely reasonable. Okay, let's keep going and let's look at another compound, compound B, which has two carboxylic acid functionalities. Let's take about three to four minutes and let's try to name this compound using the IUPAC nomenclature conventions. And if you have any questions, or if you'd like to share your proposed responses, don't be shy to share your questions or proposed responses in the chat, verbally, or annotated directly onto the class whiteboard. 
So we have a proposed name of 2-methylpropanedioic acid. So in this case, they're using the following numbering convention. We have a methyl group at the two position. We have a propane chain. And because we have two carboxylic acids, we use the dioic suffix. So we see a fair amount of class agreement for this proposed name. And 2-methylpropanedioic acid looks completely reasonable. Are there any other questions on this example? Any other responses for this example? I have a question for this one. When, sure. when name uh, is seen on the example, it says propanoic. Um, would we, for this case, since it's a dye, would we name it propane dioic acid? Yes. Or would Yes, so in the event where you have two carboxylic acids, you retain the propane ending, the ane ending, and you add the dioic acid as the suffix. If it's a single carboxylic acid, then you change the suffix to the oic acid suffix. Okay, so for the dyes, this is a, this, this special case where we keep it as propane then? Or we keep yes. the ending. Yes. Okay, got it. Exactly. Any other questions on this example? Okay, let's look at an, another set of more complicated carboxylic acid structures. So in this case, let's take a look at the following structure and let's try to develop an IUPAC name for this compound. Keeping in mind that we need to note the stereochemistry at each stereocenter or other source of stereochemistry in this molecule. So let's take about another three to four minutes and let's work through this example. And then I'd like students to share their proposed IEPAC names in the chat verbally or annotated directly onto the class whiteboard. So we have some students noting that our high priority groups are on the same side of the alkene. So we have a Z alkene. That's an important thing to note. Now let's take what we've, what we've learned in terms of carboxylic acid nomenclature and let's try to name the substituents on this carboxylic acid and then combine our substituent names locant numbers and carboxylic acid nomenclature suffixes together to get the full name. And if there are any questions, don't be shy to send them my way. ME stands for a methyl group. So ME is often used as a replacement and an equivalent of the CH3 group. So would anyone like to propose a name for this compound? Or would anyone like to start trying to name the substituents on this carboxylic acid chain? Let's keep working through this example, and I'd like to see some student responses in the chat or verbally. So we have a proposed name for this compound in the chat of Z5-bromo. 
four chloro, two six dimethyl, And then what's the rest of the name? Would you mind re resubmitting that name? 2,6-dimethyl, and then what's the ending that you have proposed for this name? I think they have het, methyl het. Okay, 2,6-dimethyl, heptuene, okay, perfect. Tuenoic acid. Yep, so let's take a look at this name and let's see what the class thinks. Do we have any proposed changes for this name? Um, professor? Yes. So um, why can't we number it a different way so that bromide would be three instead? Ah, in terms, in terms of naming compounds containing a carboxylic acid, we generally assign the carboxylic acid carbon, the lowest possible locan number. In oh, which okay. case, the carboxylic acid is assigned locan number one. Okay. Oh, okay. So Does that's that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Do we have any other questions? Do we have an alternative name for this compound? Does anyone have a modification for this proposed name? What does the class think? Does anyone notice a change? One thing I would note is that whenever you specify the stereochemistry, you need to include the locant number or the carbon containing that stereocenter. So the full name would be 2Z5-bromo4-chloro-2,6-dimethyl-hept-2-enoic acid. Otherwise, the student proposed name was almost perfect. Even the in, um, in the hept-2-enoic acid, we still have to put it like yes, in the 2 In the case where you have multiple stereocenters or multiple unique locations containing stereochemistry, you need to specify the stereochemistry at each position. Okay. I see. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Any other questions on this example? If not, Let's keep going and let's look at this next case. In this case, we have another case of two carboxylic acid functionalities in the same molecule. Let's try to develop a reasonable IUPAC name for the following compound. So let's take about three to four minutes to work through this example. And I'd like students to share their proposed responses in the chat verbally or annotated directly onto the class whiteboard. And if there are any questions or proposed responses, again, don't be shy to share them in the chat or verbally. So let's keep working through this example, and I'd like to see students sharing their proposed responses in the chat, verbally, or annotated directly onto the class whiteboard. 
So does anyone have a proposed name for this compound? Or does anyone have a question as they're trying to name this compound? Let's try to continue to work through these examples and I'd like to see some discussion and proposed responses. So would anyone like to share their proposed name for this compound or a question? So you can name that as isopropyl. You can also name it using the expanded name of propan2il. Both would be fine. ISO is counted as part of alphabetical order if you choose to use it. In both cases, the hydroxy substituent would be first alphabetically. So based on this, would anyone like to share their proposed responses and the proposed name for this compound? So when we have a ketone, when we have a ketone, the ketone is a lower priority functional group. And as we discussed in previous chapters, any carbonyl substituent, such as part of a ketone or aldehyde, if it's not the highest priority group, it's named as a substituent using the oxo prefix. So with that information in mind, would anyone like to try to name this compound? Considering the carboxylic acid is a higher priority functional group than a ketone, and considering that to name a ketone substituent, you use the oxo prefix. So we have a proposed name in the chat and I'm gonna write out their locant numbers. So we have a proposed name of 4-hydroxy, 3-isopropyl, 5-oxo, hexanoic acid. So that name looks great so far are we missing something or is there something that we need to account for? Stereochemistry. And as one of the other students noted, this stereocenter is an S stereocenter. Now it's important that we justify that. So in terms of priority, hydroxyls priority one, carbon directly attached to the carbonyls priority two, Carbon attached to the isopropyl group, priority three, tracing from highest to lowest priority, that gives us an S stereocenter. Does that make sense to everyone? Any other questions on this proposed name? Does anyone have any other modifications for this proposed name? Question. So for the ketone, we would just leave it as literally just oxo 
Like, yes, and that's the generic. That's the generic notation of any carbonyl substituent, be it a ketone or an aldehyde, both of which are lower priority than a carboxylic acid. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, because I was having trouble with that part, so I didn't know where to, no what to do with it. No worries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions that I can address? If he is on the carb um, and it was an aldehyde, would, would the 6-oxo just imply that it was an aldehyde since we know we have hexane? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that idea make sense? Yes, uh, thank you. Perfect. Okay. So let's look at some cyclic systems. Well, by definition, a carboxylic acid must be terminal because there's no other way to have that substitution pattern on a non-terminal carbon. Does that make sense? Did that answer the question in the chat? Perfect. So let's take a moment and let's try to name this cyclic compound. This is a cyclic compound with, with stereochemistry at a few stereocenters. So let's try to note and name this compound following the IUPAC method for cyclic carboxylic acids accounting for stereochemistry. So let's take a few minutes and let's try to name this compound. And if there are any questions, don't be shy to ask in the chat or verbally, and don't be shy to share your proposed names for these compounds in the chat or verbally. And I'd be happy to provide my input and feedback. So we have a proposed name of, I'm including the numbers just to help everyone contextualize this student proposed name. So we have a proposed name of 3-hydroxy-5-iodo. I appreciate the fact that the hydroxyl group was given priority in numbering because H comes before I alphabetically, cyclohexane, carboxylic acid. And I also appreciate that the student used the carboxylic acid suffix, which noted that this is a carboxylic acid attached to a cyclic carbon chain. As everyone is starting to note, we need to note the stereochemistry of these two stereocenters. We already are beginning to see some initial proposals for stereochemistry of 3S three 3S5R. Okay, let me include those annotations. So what do we think? Do we agree or do we disagree with this proposed name? Does anyone have an alternative stereochemical assignment? Is it possible that they can be both S or am I just looking at it incorrectly? They can be, but let's delve into the stereochemistry in this case and let's justify our answer. So the alcohol is priority one. Now, this is a very interesting case when it comes to priority. What is higher priority, an iodine or a carbon atom. 
iodine. Yeah. Okay. And then the alkyl chain on top is priority three. So tracing, we get an S stereocenter for our first stereocenter. Now let's repeat this same idea. What's higher priority, an oxygen or a carbon? What's higher uh, priority? Uh, yep, exactly right. Oxygen is higher priority. So the iodine's priority one, the carbon attached to the oxygen's priority two, the carbon attached to the carboxylic acid is priority three. So in this case, are we dealing with a clockwise or counterclockwise motion counting from highest to lowest priority? Is this an R or S stereocenter? Yep, it's an R stereocenter. So the 3S 5R assignment is perfectly correct. So 3S 5R 3 hydroxy 5 iodo cyclohexane carboxylic acid is a perfectly reasonable name for this compound. Does this example make sense to everyone? Do we have any questions on this example? Okay, so let's keep going now. And let's look at one last example, keeping in mind that when you have an aldehyde substituent and specifically a one carbon aldehyde substituent, this group is named as a formal group. Remember how we talked about different acetyl group derivatives? So for example, if there is a methyl attached, this is an acetyl group. Well, if there's a hydrogen attached, it's a formal group. The reason why we covered the names of many of these acetyl group derivatives is because they come up when you start to see cyclic systems. So with this information, let's try to apply this information and apply the rules for naming carboxylic acids to provide an IUPAC name for the following cyclic compound. And you may see compounds very similar to this in the context of intramolecular aldol reactions and the reduction of anhydrides, for example. So, would anyone like to propose a name for the following compound? Or if you have a question, you can also ask your question in the chat or verbally, and I'd be happy to address your questions. Is that uh, the first, the top little example, is that formaldehyde? Um, so formaldehyde would be if there are two hydrogens attached. When we talk oh. about acyl group derivatives, an acyl group with a hydrogen attached is known as a formal group. So this side chain would be known as a formal substituent. Okay. It's just like, it's nice. The name is derived from formaldehyde, just like the acetyl group name is also derived from the parent, either acetic acid or other parent acetyl group chain. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So we have a proposed name already of trans two formal cyclopentane carboxylic acid. And that name is fine. There's nothing inherently wrong with using the cis-trans nomenclature. However, it doesn't denote absolute stereochemistry. It only denotes relative stereochemistry. 
So would anyone like to take a shot at converting this trans naming convention into R and S naming convention? Generally, I prefer the R and S naming convention in cases where you're dealing with enantiomerically pure compounds. That way there is no ambiguity for the absolute configuration of the stereocenter. So we have a lot of students commenting that they've assigned both of these stereocenters as S. So to help us with that, we're going to draw out, we're going to draw out not the mirror image, but the rotated structure. You do not want to draw the mirror image, otherwise you'd get the enantiomer and your, all of your configurations would be reversed. So the carboxylic acid carbons, priority one, chain with the aldehydes, priority two, chain with the carbons, priority three. So we have an S stereocenter. Remember, to use this method of assigning stereochemistry, your lowest priority group needs to be in the back. Aldehydes, priority one, chain containing the carboxylic acids, priority two, alkyl chains, priority three. That gives us an S stereocenter. So we name this as 1S, 2S, 2 formal cyclopentane. Carboxylic acid. And now this is subjective, but in some conventions, they do note the locant number of the carboxylic acid in cyclic chains by calling this cyclopentane one carboxylic acid. This is somewhat up to convention. You can include this locant number or you can omit it and say that it's implied. It's partially because we're denoting stereochemistry, it helps eliminate some of the ambiguity. But generally for cyclic systems, it's not uncommon to see IUPAC names include the locant number for the carboxylic acid in the name. Um, okay, I have a question. So originally we said that trans could be used, like if we had the enantiomer of this compound, that would also be trans, right? Yes, however, trans 2 formal cyclopentane carboxylic acid includes two unique compounds, right? Oh, one okay. S and the 1R2R variant. Oh, okay. Do the stereochemistry using RS nomenclature and, and the RS convention minimizes and eliminates the ambiguity. The reason why your book sometimes uses cis and trans stems from the fact that the stereocenter is not a legitimate stereocenter. The, pro, the compound is symmetrical and as such R and S would be inappropriate. Does that make sense? So for example, if you have something yeah. like this, it's not quite appropriate to say 1R, 1R, 4R, for example, because these stereocenters are not legitimate stereocenters. Thus, the denotion of cis 1,4-dihydroxycyclopentane is more appropriate because it denotes the relative stereochemistry in, an, in a non-ambiguous way because there's no other enantiomer in this case. Does okay. that question make sense? Yeah, it does, thank you. And of course, in many cases, when you're looking at a lot of reactions where we have a mixture of enantiomers going into the reaction, sure, cis and trans is reasonable, 
R and S is more appropriate when you start from an anti-emerically pure materials, or if you want to clearly indicate when you have one specific enantiomer or diastereoisomer for that matter. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so we've covered a lot of examples of naming carboxylic acids, and now as per convention, we're now going to look at our next functional group, which are nitriles. Nitriles, which are denoted by the RCN abbreviation. So nitriles are denoted by your alkyl group attached to the carbon, which is triple bonded to nitrogen. Note, there is an important distinction between the normal nitrile and the less common relative, which is known as an isonitrile. So nitriles require a specific connectivity where your main chain is bonded to the nitrile carbon. Does that distinction make sense to everyone? We would be able to tell the difference between an iso isonitrile and nitrile by smell alone as isonitriles generally have very unpleasant smells and have quite different patterns of reactivity. Nitriles are often very closely related to carboxylic acids and they're named using a very similar convention. So first you name the longest parent chain containing the nitrile. You then name the nitrile using carboxylic acid nomenclature. And it's important to note that complex nitriles are acids and you name nitriles as derivatives of carboxylic acids. So you replace the ic acid suffix or oic acid suffix with the suffix o nitrile. The nitrile carbon is generally assigned the lowest possible locant number. So for example, if we start with acetic acid, we would name the nitrile derivative of acetic acid as acetonitrile. Does everyone see how we replaced the IC suffix with the O nitrile suffix? Oh, yes, I can oh, yeah. for a moment. Everyone okay now? Okay, perfect. Likewise, if you start from benzoic acid and you're looking at the nitrile derivative of benzoic acid, we'd name benzoic acid's nitrile derivative as benzonitrile. Looking at a more complicated example, 2,2-dimethylcyclohexane carboxylic acid would be the formal name of the parent carboxylic acid. If we're naming the nitrile derivative, we replace the carboxylic acid ending with carbonitrile. Does this convention make sense to everyone? Any questions on this example? Okay, so let's try to apply what we've learned here. And let's try to name a set of compounds that we'll label them A and B. Nitriles, similar to carboxylic acids, are high priority functional groups. And as such, will almost always get the lowest possible locant number whenever possible. One thing that I would caution everyone on is that many of these structures have stereochemistry and thus your name needs to account for the stereochemistry of each stereocenter. 
So this example is a quite the interesting review. So let's take about three to four minutes to work through these two examples. And let's have students share their proposed names for each of these compounds in the chat verbally or annotated directly onto the class whiteboard. And if there are any questions or parts I can provide feedback on, don't be shy to send them my way and I'll be happy to provide my input and feedback. Is this the same as like the carboxylic acid where when it's a chain, we count the carbon, but yeah, if it's cyclic, we it. don't like technically yeah. count it? Okay. Well, when it's cyclic, then the lowest number is assigned to the carbon attached to the nitrile. Well, yeah. Acyclic, the nitrile carbon is counted as part of the main chain. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. So does anyone have a proposal to name any of these two compounds? Does anyone have a proposed name for any of these two compounds that they'd like to share with the class? Are we counting the carbon attached to the nitrogen when counting the chain? The nitrile carbon is in fact counted as part of the main chain. Okay, thank you. And remember, we need to assign the stereochemistry of all stereocenters. Does anyone have a proposed name or a question that they encountered when naming either compound A or B? Let's keep working on these examples. And I'd greatly appreciate students sharing their proposed responses in the chat or verbally. Well, we have a proliferation of proposed names. So in this case, first looking at this alkene, let's take, let's take this one step at a time here. And first, is this alkene E or Z? It's E, yep. So we have proposed names of 2E, 4-methyl, pent-2-ene, O-nitra. Did we miss a stereocenter here? Or is there something a little bit special about this, this center here, circled and... Uh, I don't think it's a stereo center because um, two of the substituents are the same. Exactly right, exactly right. So always remember when you're interpreting a structure, make sure the stereo center is a legitimate stereo center. We saw a lot of examples of reactions that can create symmetrical structures or create a symmetrical substitution pattern around what was initially a unique stereocenter. So it's important when naming, you only have to specify the configuration if you actually have a stereocenter. Does that idea make sense to everyone? So, to break down this name, we have the methyl at the four position. 2E denotes we have an E alkene at the two position. Pent, because we have a five carbon chain. 2E to note we are, have an alkene at the two position. And the O nitrile suffix denotes that we have a nitrile as our highest priority substituent. Did that answer your question? 
Did that address your question in the chat? So the O nitrile suffix is used to denote that we have a nitrile, while the ene suffix denotes the alkene at the two position. Any other questions on this first example? Any other questions on this first example? So one thing I would note and one modification is that in this case, it would be two pentene, pent two ene. So let's look at what happens if we have a parent carboxylic acid. So we name this as 2E four methyl pent two ene oic acid. And in this case, we replace this suffix with the O nitrile suffix. So this would be 2E4-methyl-pent-2-ene O nitrile. Does that make sense to everyone? Does that make sense for the name for this compound? Any follow-up questions that we have on naming this nitrile compound? We're essentially just applying the rules for naming carboxylic acids, except this time we have to modify our name to account for the fact that we're looking at the nitrile derivative. What would happen if we had a nitrile and a carboxylic acid? So if you have a nitrile and a carboxylic acid, those structures are not particularly common but then you have to look at the relative priority of those two substituents. So in this case, if we're comparing a nitrile and a carboxylic acid, the nitrile is lowest priority and it's named using the cyano prefix. That kind of complex naming won't be discussed until a little bit later on in this class, but for your reference, the carboxylic acid is higher priority and the nitrile is named as a substituent using the cyano prefix. Okay. Did yeah. that answer your question? Yeah. Perfect. So let's try to apply what we've learned from the first example and let's take a, let's take a few more minutes to try and name this second compound which contains two stereocenters and a nitrile substituent. So let's try to name this compound utilizing the IUPAC nomenclature, nomenclature conventions. Wow, it's great to see we already have a proposed name in the chat of 2R5S2Chloro5Hydroxyhet. So if we are naming the parent carboxylic acid, this would be a hexanoic acid main chain. So if we're replacing the ending, what would we call this compound? Rather than hexanoic acid, looking at our naming conventions, we would call this hexanonitra. So we have a little bit of contention with regards to the stereochemistry. One thing that I would like to note is in order to apply and assign the RNS configurations using the method 
that I've showed you earlier on in this class, your lowest priority group needs to be in the back, pointing into the plane of the page. In that case, let's delve into the stereochemistry a little bit. We see that the chlorine stereocenter has a configuration of S and your hydroxyl group stereocenter has a configuration of R. Part of the reason why I think the initially proposed configuration was the opposite is just because these groups, we noticed that our hydrogen, our lowest priority group is not in the back. So that would give you the opposite assigned configuration. Does that make sense to everyone? Does everyone see why these two stereocenters are S and R respectively? Okay, any other questions on this example before we move on and look at one other example of naming nitriles? Okay, let's try to apply what we've learned to this last example, which is a nitrile attached to a cyclic carbon chain. So let's take a few minutes and let's try to name the following compound using IUPAC naming conventions. And I'd greatly appreciate if students would share their proposed responses in the chat or verbally. And if there are any questions I can address, don't be shy to ask in the chat verbally and I'll be happy to address your questions. So as we're working through this example, does anyone have a proposed name that they'd like to share for this compound? Remembering that cyclic nitriles and cyclic carboxylic acids are named using a slightly different suffix. So what does the class think? Do we have any proposed names? We have some students already starting to assign stereochemistry. They're noting that these stereocenters are possibly R stereocenters. Okay. Would anyone like to try to put together these stereochemical assignments and substituent names into a full name? So we have a proposed name of one R 3S, interesting, 3-ethyl cyclohexane carbonitrile. And you can put the one locan number as well. So we have a little bit of contention on this second stereocenter. So let's take a look and let's assign the stereochemistry. Nitrile carbons, priority one. Alkyl group closest to the ethyl, priority two. Alkyl group farthest from the ethyl, priority three. This first center is R. 
Let's look at the second stereo center now. Ethyl group is the lowest priority. Alkyl chain closest to the nitrile is the highest. Alkyl chain within the ring is the second highest. So tracing counterclockwise, that gives us an S stereo center. Does that make sense to everyone? Perfect. Any other questions on this proposed name? Any other questions on this example and our naming conventions for nitriles and carboxylic acids? I would say knowing how to name carboxylic acids is pretty important because we're going to see next chapter at least six carboxylic acid variants that are named using the same carboxylic acid nomenclature guidelines. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about some structure and properties of carboxylic acids. So we know that carboxyl carbon is sp2 hybridized and carboxylic acid groups are planar, flat with bond angles of about 120 degrees. Carboxylic acids generally have quite high boiling points because they can form hydrogen bonds and carboxylic acids often exist as cyclic dimers held together by two hydrogen bonds. Carboxylic acids are pretty interesting in that they have a hydrogen bond donor and acceptor. So you can often see these dimeric structures which in turn leads to a very strong intramolecular attraction between two molecules containing a carboxylic acid, which generally helps explain why carboxylic acids have generally quite high boiling points. Does that discussion make sense to everyone? These strong hydrogen bonding interactions lead to higher boiling points than the corresponding alcohols. Okay, let's keep going now. And let's talk a little bit about the dissociation of carboxylic acids. So carboxylic acids, as their name implies, are in fact acids and they are proton donors towards weak and strong bases so they can react with weak or even strong bases to produce carboxylate salts. Carboxylate salts, interestingly enough, are water soluble. While carboxylic acids with more than six carbons are only slightly soluble in water. We've actually utilized this property in the previous 112 lab where we extracted a carboxylic acid from a mixture containing other non-acidic components. So it's important to note this unique feature, both in terms of how carboxylic acids can react as acids and the solubility of carboxylic acids and carboxylate salts. Does this discussion make sense to everyone? This is very useful if you want to isolate and separate a carboxylic acid. Okay, so when we talk about carboxylic acids, not all carboxylic acids are created equal. Carboxylic acids can transfer a proton to water to give H3O plus and carboxylate anions. The acidity constant Ka is about 10 to the negative fifth for a typical carboxylic acid with a pKa of around five. The Ka value and the larger the observed Ka value, 
the greater amount of dissociation of our carboxylic acid is observed at equilibrium. PKA serves as a gauge for the KA, and generally the smaller your PKA value, the stronger your acid. One thing that's really interesting, just like alcohols, we can study the effect of substituents on carboxylic acid PKA. As we can see, electronegative substituents can stabilize your carboxylate anion and help promote the formation of your carboxylate anion. So we have these CF3 groups, trifluoroacetic acid. Is this CF3 group an electron withdrawing or donating group? Is this CF3 group a withdrawing or donating group? Withdrawing, right? And as we see, is trifluoroacetic acid a strong or weak acid? Is it a stronger or weaker relative acid? Just looking at this table comparing to like acetic acid, it's definitely a stronger acid. And that's because this CF3 group stabilizes your carboxylate anion via inductive withdrawing effects. Does that discussion make sense to everyone? Generally, withdrawing groups help stabilize your carboxylate anion and thus increase the acidity of your carboxylate proton. Okay, so let's keep going and let's talk about some inductive effects on acidity. So generally, fluoroacetic, chloroacetic, and bromoacetic acids are stronger acids than acetic acid. And multiple electronegative substituents have synergistic effects on acidity. The more inductive or resonance withdrawing groups you have, the more acidic your carboxylic acid proton will become. Does that idea make sense? We can see this in this example, where as we increase the number of withdrawing chlorine atoms, our carboxylic acid proton pKa decreases precipitously. Now, when you look at aromatic carboxylic acids, you can begin to notice an additional trend. Withdrawing groups and deactivating groups stabilize your carboxylate anion and in turn increase the acidity of the carboxylic acid proton. Wonderful. However, we begin to see a really interesting effect when we start to look at electron donors. What do we notice when we have electron donating groups? What happens to the acidity of our carboxylic acid proton? Does it increase or decrease when we have electron donating groups? specifically pi donors, such as an alcohol or a methoxy group. What happens to our carboxylic acid proton acidity? Becomes less acidic. And part of the reason for that is this pi donor group destabilizes the carboxylate anion via donation. If you have an electron rich anion and you're shoving additional electron density adjacent to that very electron rich carboxylate group, you're gonna destabilize that carboxylate anion. And as a result, it's more difficult for you to generate that carboxylate anion and that carboxylic acid proton is less acidic. 
Does that argument make sense to everyone? Okay, so let's keep going and let's just restate this idea of aromatic substituent effects. An electron withdrawing group, such as a nitro group, increases acidity by stabilizing the carboxylate anion. An electron donating group decreases acidity by destabilizing the carboxylate anion. One thing that's pretty interesting is you can use the pK of your carboxylic acid to begin to get a sense of whether an aromatic ring is activated or deactivated. And you can even use the pK values to begin to estimate the electronic character of your parent ring. So you can begin to look and see how different substituents impact the carboxylic acid pKa, how substituents impact whether you have an electron rich or electron poor aromatic ring, and you can begin to start to estimate and start to look at the activation energy for aromatic substitution reactions, for example. So pKa's for aromatic carboxylic acids give us a lot of information on the character of your aromatic ring. Does this idea make sense? Um, a situation deactivating in and of itself? Could or you Yes. Well, the carboxylic acid in and of itself deactivates the ring, but when looking at substituent effects for aromatic carboxylic acids, you can begin to look at how additional substituents impact the character of an aromatic ring by looking at the pKa values. So if you remove the carboxylic acid, you get a sense of how these different substituents impact the character and reactivity of your aromatic ring. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, thank you. So PKA is a measurable quantity that provides us a sense of the electronic character of these substituted aromatic carboxylic acids. Okay, so let's talk about Uh, it, it gives you a qualitative sense of whether you have a donor or withdrawing substituent. So we've talked a lot about carboxylic acids. Let's talk about some methods to prepare carboxylic acids. The first of which is the oxidation of a substituted alkyl benzene with permanganate or sodium dichromate. This is a very harsh reaction. And as a result, you're generally gonna oxidize almost every other functional group in your molecule that's remotely oxidizable. So this is quite useful for oxidizing alkyl benzene substituents. Primary alkyl, alkyl groups are oxidized to carboxylic acids. Secondary alkyl groups are oxidized to ketones. Tertiary alkyl groups are generally not reactive. However, for certain substrates, this is an incredibly useful method to prepare carboxylic acids from the parent alkyl groups. Does this reaction make sense to everyone? And I just want you to note, this is a harsh reaction. So you certainly don't wanna run this in the presence of an alcohol or an amine because you're certainly gonna oxidize other things in your molecule. Any questions on this reaction? Okay, so let's apply what we've learned now. It's important when we see a new reaction and we're beginning to predict the products that we can apply what we've learned to predict the products 
for the reaction of new substrates. So let's look at these two examples. I'd like us to take about three to four minutes, and then I'd like students to draw out the structure for the two reactions and the product for these two reactions. You don't need to show a mechanism in this case, but I'd like students to be able to predict the product for this benzylic oxidation using potassium permanganate. In the first case, we have a primary substrate. In the second case, we have a secondary substrate. And this is an exhaustive oxidation. So you're generally oxidizing up your benzylic position to the highest possible oxidation number. So we have a student accurately predicting that this first substrate, which has a primary alkyl group, would yield a carboxylic acid. Our secondary alkyl group would yield a ketone. What does the rest of the class think? Do we agree? Do we disagree? Do we have another question? I see a fair amount of agreement. Perfect. So let's just clear annotations and let's draw out these structures. When you have a primary benzylic alkyl group in the presence of permanganate water and an excess amount of heat, you'll be able to generate the carboxylic acid. Secondary substrates only have two hydride equivalents and thus can only be oxidized up to the ketone. Now, just to make sure everyone's paying attention here, if we have the following alkyl group and we treat it with potassium permanganate, water, and heat, what will happen? What will we see? No reaction, exactly right. Tertiary and quaternary alkyl groups cannot be oxidized. There is no hydride equivalent to pull off. And you may say, well, can't you oxidize a tertiary alkyl group to yield the alcohol? You can, but it's been found that these tertiary substrates are very resistant to oxidation both due to sterics and just the fact that the way this mechanism works, you typically need to have two hydride equivalents available to get a productive reaction. Yes, this is quaternary. The tertiary substrate would also not be oxidized at all. You'd have to use an alternative method, such as maybe treating with IBX. You can even do like a radical oxidation those would be other methods. In terms of directly preparing a carboxylic acid, it's generally useful for primary benzylic substrates. Does that happen? Did that address your questions? Do these examples make sense to everyone? Perfect. So this is a good stopping point for today. So we'll, our 